The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar on the export essentials of customs compliance. My name is William Barnes-Graham, and I am a digital content manager at open to export We are an online community helping small UK businesses get ready to sell overseas through our step-by-step -step articles and guides, regular webinars, our export action plan tool, and our quarterly competitions. You can find all of these on our website at www.opentexport.com. Open to Export is powered by the Institute of Export and International Trade, the UK's only professional membership body for traders, offering a unique range of individual and business membership benefits, education and training catering for beginners through to master's degrees, and an always exciting and prestigious programme of events celebrating UK businesses' exporting achievements. We will be running a live Q&A at the end of the session, and you can ask questions at any point during this webinar using the, using the question box on the control panel to the right-hand side of your screen. We have two great speakers today. Uh, we'll have Arnie Milken from Amber Road and also the young president of the Institute of Exports, and he will be giving an overview of the essentials of customs and also a little bit about the potential impact of Brexit. Before David McMillan from Bellore Log Logistics talks about the support a logistics of services provider can give to you as an exporter. But to begin things, over to you, Arnie. Well, thank you so much, Will, and uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this introduction into the most exciting topic in the world, customs declarations and duties. Now, I'm assuming you are starting off or you are wanting to discover this for the first or maybe the second time, and you want to know a little bit more about what customs is, uh, is all about. So this is really a high-level introduction at the sort of things uh, you will be learning about as you embark on this exciting world of, of customs, customs declarations and duties. Now, um, before we get into the um, the topics, here is a little bit of the rundown what we're gonna what we're gonna talk about: customs and duties. Why do they exist in the first place? You certainly read about and hear about customs, customs union, and customs all this um, in the news lately. So we're gonna demystify this a little look at those uh, and what they are and how they affect not only exporters but of course importers and, and uh, much of what i say here also um, or predominantly um, um, concerns the importers as well um, we also need to talk about what happens if you do not get it right um, so there is a compliance and risk aspect here that we need to focus on and then of course the one we can't do without uh, I will yet to see the day where this word does not feature any time in the day. Brexit will be part of this. So we're going to look at this briefly. Now, on the next slide, you'll see what Amber Road does. I don't want to dwell on it, but just to say we're in the global trade management software and information services business, and we help all importers, exporters, third party, uh, party logistics providers to automate their supply chain, to digitalize their supply chain, and then reap the benefits of that, especially as you are growing globally. The kind of companies we help, you can see on the next slide. Um, and so we are in the trading space, we're in the custom space, and we need to, to know about this stuff. So let's get into it then, introduction to customs. Well, at this point of time, our favorite topic in Great Britain is the European Union. It is a customs union, as we all know now. It's in the news so many times, and that means that we have a common law, and the law applies across all the member states, currently 28. Um, however, of course, there is, um, while there is a common law called the Union Customs Code, there are significant differences on how the law is interpreted in all the member states. Yet there, if, if, if you pin it down to the very high level bits, there are four aspects in customs that I think, you know, give you the fund fundamental idea. Number one is the aspect of classification. So every product will be assigned a specific number, numerical code, a number. And this is due to the nature of the international movement of goods. So you can't describe a good in words because it will mean something else if somebody's not speaking English. So you need a number. Have you, if you've got a number, then the equivalent in the other language um, can be expressed in a better way, right? So TV 
uh, will be something else in uh, in you know in 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 Mandarin. And so if you have a number for TV, then you can just write the Mandarin name for TV. And so with the number, you identify um, the good. The origin is where the good uh, where the product originates from. That's going to be important for the duty reliefs and also establishing um some economic measures uh, anti-dumping duties they're the key word or some other restrictions or prohibitions valuation is the value of the imported product and here is just to say that what is of high value to me may not be of high value to you and so we need to find an international um, general harmonized way of understanding how to value the goods and then the duty reliefs, that is when you are you're, you're reducing your customs duty. So you have a fixed duty linked to the code, but you don't really want to pay it. So you look for duty reliefs to see if you can safeguard this duty or not pay it. And the two concepts in all of these four boxes to understand is it is classification plus the origin, which will determine the rate of import duty to be paid. So classification, the number plus where it's from, will tell you how high and how much you have to pay. The valuation, however, will determine the value against which the rate of duty is applied. So what that means is you establish the number, the duty you have to pay, 5%, 10% as a combination of classification and origin. And then you have 10%, now 10% of what? And that is the value, right? So value, um, origin and classification are the three things you really need. Otherwise, they are, you won't go anywhere in customs. All right, let's look at the next slide. Let's go through these in a little bit more detail. And as I said, this is only an, an introduction. For a start, custom classification uh, is, is the baseline. Without a correct code of what this product actually is, you cannot import or export. So when you're working with third-party logistic providers, you need to provide this code. There are a lot of codes out there, as you can see. Uh, and you need to really know what your product is going to detail of what this product is to find this code. Um, once you have a code, you will be able to see the duty rate. You will be able to see any tariff measures. That's what they, the EU calls it. So anti-dumping duty or special duty, not only the, the, the normal rate of duty, but you know, whatever is levied on top. And if there are any licensing requirements, import certificates, export certificates, all of this is in the code. Now with the code, once you've got it, you also have the nature of the product, the main characteristics of the product. So example, it's a different whether you import something that's of plastic or of wood. The type of product, is it nuts, is it bolts, is it silk, is it scarf, what is it? And any distinguishing characteristics. So in this case, we have flexible tubes and pipes as opposed to non-flexible tube and pipes. So you see this takes a level of detail which is quite extraordinary. So let's get into a practice. Please look at this and tell me what are these. We're in customs classification, we're trying to find this number and I am showing this this product to you, and I ask you to tell me, to describe to me what this is. Okay, and the, the rule is, there is only one correct commodity code for every product, okay? Um, and when the price is, if you get the six digits code right, you can use it in 200 countries to import and export, right? It's a little bit more complex than that, but at the heart of it all, that's where we start with. So some of you may say, well, I just see metal. I just see manufactured metal that could be cogs, bearings, housings, change. Others say, no, 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 no. I'm a motorcycle fan. I know these are motorcycle parts, but they are specially designed for a certain type of motor vehicle, of, of motorcycle. So you can see how different this is according to how you interpret this. Let's get one step further. Take a look at these. Next slide, please. Now try to figure out what is the actual product. Remember, first you need to know what it is so that you get to the right number. Now imagine you take the first example and you import a globe. Then that would be wrong because this is a pencil sharpener. And besides, a globe has a different duty rate than a 
globe-shaped pencil sharpener. What is this Leatherman tool actually? How would you ever find a, a, the right classification number if you don't even know what the thing really is? This could be all sorts of mechanical issues, um, um, mechanical pr products here. The desk organizer is another thing. So sometimes things have been put together and that makes it really difficult to find the correct number. Now, if you don't, then you're gonna find you know, a, a number that is associated with a duty rate, which might not be correct. As a result, you may be over or underpaying customs duty. So much I will say on classification. There's so much more to say, but as an introduction, we'll leave it at that point. If you remember, with classification came origin. So let's look at origin quickly. So the country of origin is also a completely um, ambiguous concept. The question is, where are you from? But the answer is not so easy. Because if you look at the products, and here we have two examples, the laptop battery charger showing various signs and symbols, uh, as well as a, the back front of an iPhone that says, designed in Apple um, by Apple in California, but assembled in China. So you can see this, the, deciding where a product is from is not so easy. Um, there are also lots of other confusing things that have nothing to do with customs, like for marketing purposes, you may make a big sign, they made it in EU or made in UK. Um, but from a customs point of view, you need to folk, folk follow the legal rules, the FTAs, the free trade agreements, um, and the rules of origin, which establish from a customs purposes where a product originate from. And this is complicated by the fact that there are two types of origin. There is non-preferential origin and preferential origin. And I'll only focus on preferential origin because this has the, the money attached to it. But non-preferential origin, slightly different in that it is a origin which associates the need for these licenses and requirements. So imagine if you are importing a product from say um, Iran or Iraq, you may want to have a certificate um, that certifies the, um, the use of it. Or equally, if you are thinking of exporting into uh, Iran or Iraq, there may be a export license required. It's maybe obvious, but you can see if you were to import the same or export the same product into say, um, say Turkey, then you wouldn't necessarily need um, such a license. I hope this makes sense. Now, preferential on the next slide, you will see is very important for money reasons, for saving money, because there are these things called preferential trade agreements, also much in the news, also called bilateral free trade agreements. And these require you to prove the origin of a product. And if you do, you may be able to reduce the duty due on that product. But again, there is a complex set of origin rules that you need to follow and that's prescribed in those FTA, these free trade agreements. And for that, really, uh, we would need another seminar just to go through the basics of that. Um, enough to say, you need to spend some time to understand what you need to do. But once you understood it, and once you follow the system, it'll become much easier. In any case, a certificate of origin or the next next big thing called a registered exporter um, scheme certificate number needs to be provided. And that just assures that you have done the steps needed to prove the origin of this product for which you then get duty benefits. There are also unilateral EU preferences scheme. They are called uh, GSP and GSP plus, as well as LDC, so generalized system of preferences and um, everything but arms agreement for least developed countries. And they uh, help um, less developed countries to export their products to the European market and they have an immediate duty benefit. Last but not least, we have customs valuation. Um, so this is the concept where you establish what the value of a product is. And again, there are quite complex valuation rules that you need to follow. Su sufficient to say that in order to value a product, you follow uh, one of these methods in uh, order, and that will give you then a um, independent uh, objective value of a product. And the key one is the transaction value method, 
and you can see here the parts of the legal text, that would be the price actually paid or payable for the goods when sold for export to the customs territory of the union, the community, so the European Union or the, here the community subject to specific adjustments where necessary. Now, if you're confused, then that's totally understandable. But as you can see, it's all a legal text. Roughly 90% of all customs valuations are determined by this method. And it's established that between the buyer and the seller, there is no relationship um, and there is no influence that could change the price due to this influence. But that you are getting the price it would sell on the free market. Roughly, that's what it's about. And you can see there are some additions and deductions that you need to make in terms of royalties, commission, goods uh, supplied for free or charged at the reduced costs. All of this influences the, the, the price up or down, and this needs to be taken into consideration. Again, it's a minefield, but it's logical once you get the hang of it. And finally, the best part to last, that's your duty release. And uh, there you're looking at what the EU calls special procedures for which you need to be authorized to use. So you need to prove that you have understood how they work and you can make them, um, you, can, you can implement them operationally in your company. But once you can prove that and you've got authorization to use them, you can then make use of them. And they reduce um, or eliminate the duty, zero rate the duty, um, from the outset so here you have a list of them we won't go into them but they all do different things um, in order to help you offset and this could be for you manufacturing um, third-party goods or so goods from outside the european union which you then export or do something else with um, so they're not being sold on the european market and the other way around, you could be sending EU goods to a third country where they are processed and then sent back to be sold in your country or in the EU market. And then that's outward processing relief and so on and so on. Um, so there are lots of um, ways that you can get around paying duties, but they all follow one approach and that's you need to know what you do. Now, obviously, there are many other things that we need to talk about on uh, and customs, you heard about the authorized economic operator, for example. Time will prevent us from doing that right now, but there'll be another opportunity to deep dive into these matters as well. Um, I just want to leave you with one last slide um, before we move into the, the whole Brexit thing. That's on the legislation. Here you see an overview of the complicated um, web of um, documents that need to be consulted. And so they will keep you busy for a longer time um, to understand the exciting world of customs. It is something you can get really excited about, like like I have and 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 others did. Um, but you know, it's 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 a legal and and practical um, challenge. Let's put it that way. So here you see some of the regulations in force. Um, we will look at how this changes under Brexit. Now, if we go to the next slide. Um, before that, here is a uh, the final um, slide. It shows you the types of duties we have. Uh, so you see, not only is there customs duty, but there are other duties um, that you need to think about. And all of these are also topics for future um, webinars. So quickly on Brexit, I'm aware that I'm running shamelessly out of time here. Again, this is a um, very quick run through the impact this will have, that the, the, this decision to leave the European Union will have on, um, on the UK and also on the EU. There is another webinar, I think uh, it was two or several weeks ago, uh, specifically dedicated to Brexit. So check the Open for Export um, website for, for the webcast, the recording. Um, for me, it suffices to say that on the next slide, you will see the biggest uh, market for the UK remains by far the EU, which explains to you, and you see this here broken down in, um, in sectors, which explains to you why it is a big deal if you put a border between the UK and the EU and you introduce these customs rules. At the moment, all of these products related to these industries move freely from the UK to the EU. If you now introduce this border, all of these things that I mentioned, classification, valuation, origin, and duty relief, 
will now be put in your bucket, will now be necessary to be understood and to be implemented and all of that if worst comes to worst by the 30th of March next year, so in 13 months. That's why it's very timely we get a hang of customs ASAP. Um, you can also see that the issue is, um, is significant in the next slide. Um, and if you were wondering, well, how is that all going to impact my daily life? Look at the commuter train here in Sheffield, and you can see how many components are currently sourced from the European Union, from our continental neighbors. So to produce this train, it would need to move a lot of goods to the United Kingdom. And if each of those needs to go through classification, origin, determination, valuation, and potentially duty relief, there is a lot of work to be done. So one of the suggestions that many observers do is if you were to map your supply chain, you could see something like the following slide. Of course, given this is a rather large example, but you would see how dependent you are from the, um, from the European market. So you may source some elements of the goods you're currently uh, manufacturing or you are dealing with or you're receiving um, from other parts of the European Union. Or you may be receiving them from a consolidator, someone who is selling them to you in the UK, but actually that person or that company is sourcing them from the EU. So mapping your supply chain to find out your, your, uh, your, your exposure to European continent trade is really important. And it is then important that you understand how will I clear these goods going forward? And you may decide to do that, of course, um, by yourselves, but there are also your third, um, third uh, party logistics provider who can do that for you. Now, I will not go on to the next slide just to show you that there is a lot we know and a lot we don't know. But if you look at the next slide, you will see the future UK trade relations. You know that if, if you start on the top left, if we don't do anything and we don't have a deal, then this is where we end up, top left, WTO, UK schedules, MFN tariff levels. Now, that is the situation without a deal, meaning that the duties that you will end up are higher than if you had a, a customs arrangement or a free trade agreement. You also know that the EU has a lot of free trade agreements, whether we can use them, that's the bottom left corner, whether we can use them in the UK, that's a different matter. That is to be negotiated, to be decided on, and there, is, there are different views on whether they will be allowed in the future. What we do not know yet is if there will be a UK-EU free trade agreement, that's the top right corner, and we will also not know for the foreseeable future if there are new UK free trade agreements that will be signed or not. So all of that you can really say is in the worst case, we will go to WTO um, rules and we really need to understand, and again, this can be another webinar, uh, what this means and what this means for tariff levels. This still means customs, classifications, valuation, origin, duty reliefs. Still will be applicable after we leave. So next slide shows you the bleak outlook and tells you OMG. This is getting really bad. We have customs management costs going up. We have higher duty payments potentially. We have extra costs through more filing of customs declaration. There may be supply chain disruption and delays if you put, uh, if you put a border in between. And what is that going to say to the growth potential of my company? So you could say all is doom and gloom, but that doesn't really help, does it? So next slide will show you the real challenge. My challenge is to find what's if in Brexit, what's in it for you? What's in it for your company? Because everything can be a challenge, but what we make of it, that is the thing that differentiates us. So sure, I can count, as I have just done, you the cost of, of, of Brexit to your business. I can start today and finish tomorrow and it will still not be enough. What are you going to do about it? And when are you going to jump into action? Do you have a strategy to mitigate costs and generate better value and cost savings. Now, the next three slides, and we're gonna run through them so quickly, uh, are just gonna show you what we offer. So there is automation that can significantly help you to improve the compliance and save that has different ways of doing that. The next slide shows you the solution platform that we 
offer and you can see there is lots of import and export management that you can that you can deal with and of course all of that um, then drives value on the last slide I have for you and that is the kind of question the kind of thinking we need it we need to get into when we talk about brexit how can I turn how can I make brexit an event that will set me up for a internationally trading company that is successful and that has um, a good compliance and good uh, risk analysis and um, the Institute of Export International Trade and the Open for Export um, Network will be able to help you to navigate through this, um, these challenges in customs and, and trade well. If you want to know more about Brexit, we have a uh, white paper which is published um, on the customs arrangements after Brexit. You can find that on our website as well as you can sign up to some newsletters that we publish on the issue. That's on the next slide as well. And then finally, um, if you need to get in touch and discuss trade automation a little bit more, then by all means, you can do that too. And here are the details uh, on how to do that. Now, I've talked way enough, so I'll um, hand over to David uh, to explain you the um, impact on, or the, the, the management on the ground of how customs is implemented on a day-to-day -day basis. So, David, over to you. Thank you. Arne. Ari, thank you very much indeed. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is David McMillan. I work for Bolleray Logistics, which is a global logistics solutions provider. Um, I've been with the business uh, spanning 40 years and uh, have spent all that, uh, a good portion of that time in international trade. Uh, if we can move on to the next slide, we'll just talk about what a logistics service provider does with all of the stuff that Arne has been talking about. Um, and um, for what happens to your goods after you make a booking with an air, well, in this case, an air freight consignment, although it equally applies to ocean freight or road freight. So you pick up the phone, you call your logistics solutions provider, whoever they might be, and uh, they say, well, I need some information. Tell me what it is that you want us to move and how you want us to move it. So we need to know who you are, who you're shipping to, and we know, so need to know some details of the consignment, uh, its pieces, weight, dimensions, the commodity that you're shipping out, and the export procedure that you're planning to use. Anna touched on export licensing, and that's the primary reason that we need to know what the export uh, procedure is, although he also mentioned outward processing and inward processing reliefs. And if your goods are subject to any of those, we need to know about them when we're declaring the export to HMRC. And if we can move on to the next slide, please. So what we do then is that in the case of an air freight, we check the availability of um, a suitable aircraft to carry your goods, make sure that it will fit into the aircraft. We do that by looking at load charts, uh, which uh, identify the maximum dimensions of a piece of freight that will move on a given aircraft. We uh, check the applicability of any dangerous good, goods movements. Some of them are restricted to movement by cargo aircraft only. And then we arrange the collection from your premises. That collection may have to be on a, a security cleared vehicle um, to comply with the CAA regulations. We rate our file, we book the goods with the airline, we prepare the airway bill document, and finally, we prepare the export customs entry because all goods leaving the United Kingdom to extra EU destinations, and this will change uh, with Brexit, uh, require an export customs entry. Moving on, please. Um, we need from you a copy of your commercial invoice. Next slide. A packing list which tells customs at origin and destination what is in whatever box or boxes that you are shipping. And the next one, please. And if the goods are in any way dangerous, uh, then we need to be told about them so that we can notify the airline and we have to check that they're packed in accordance with uh, IATA, which is the International Air Transport Association regulations. We create the export customs entry, um, as you see here, um, which is our declaration to customs on your behalf um, of the goods that are moving. Now, Anna mentioned all sorts of uh, issues surrounding the classification of goods. 
Um, there are services available from the leading LSPs that will help you to identify what your goods are. But at the end of the day, um, the responsibility for declaring them correctly is yours and yours alone. We can only work on your written instructions under our approved economic operator status. Next slide, please. So um, we need, to, as I said, uh, to know uh, what the HS codes of the goods are, the values of the goods, the customs procedure to be used, and whether they are the subject of an open general license or subject to specific export controls from either the UK or perhaps one of your supplier's um, uh, regulations from their origin country. So, for example, you might be shipping some goods uh, into uh, Saudi Arabia that have originated in Canada. You would have to comply with both UK, EU and Canadian customs regulations in that case. Can we move on? So the goods then arrive with us at um, our branch office and we check that the information that you've given us is correct. We check the dimensions of the goods, we check the weight of the packages and that they're marked correctly and it all tallies up with the documentation that we've received from you to make sure that we have the right consignment in our possession. And the next slide. We then have to check that they are um, safe to transport by air and that they're not containing anything that should not be in there. So the first stage that we go through is that we have a three-day, three-dimensional x-ray of the goods. Um, if the goods are too dense to be x-rayed, then we move into a secondary screening phase for security purposes, which is shown in the next slide. And that could comprise um, swabbing the goods, um, a physical examination of them, it's uh, you know, a sort of hand search, um, sniffer dogs are often used and then there is a decompression chamber that is available to make sure that they're not going to, to go pop or bang in the event of decompression up in the aircraft's hold. And the next slide please. So we've done all of that, everything is good, everything is good to go and off they go. They go off to their uh, destination point, they're on the way and on the next slide we will see that they're uh, landing safely at destination. So what happens then? Well, we go through the same process again of an import customs clearance. This is actually a, pan a passenger customs document rather than a freight one. Um, but you have to declare to uh, customs and excise at the point of port of destination and pay any uh, appropriate duties or your customer has to on arrival. And the whole thing is reversed on imports from outside of the EU. And if we move on. The point of this is that there are a, a large number of steps in the process and um, if we get any one of them wrong, your goods can be delayed. Now, we talked a little bit about uh, Brexit and um, there's, a, there's a, a, an area and an element of doom and gloom being suggested here of uh, trucks queuing back to the periphery on the M25. Um, there are uh, contingency plans in place by Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs to take care of that and um, we're working very closely with them to make sure that um, everything is um, as under control as it can be. We still don't know the shape of Brexit, but um, once we do, we'll be ready for it. Thank you for your attention. I believe um, that uh, Will will now be chairing um, a questions and answers session. Many thanks. Thank you, David. And thank you, Arnie, as well. So that was a really great overview of customs and how it all works and some of the support you can get as well. But um, yeah, as Arnie also mentioned, um, we have run a couple of webinars on some of the aspects touched upon here. So we did a webinar on free trade agreements last year. And indeed, we've got a webinar coming up on AEA. Um, next in a couple of weeks time so do have a look at the site for info about all of that but now yeah we're going to go to the floor for questions so please do ask questions using the control panel on the right hand side um, and we've got a bit of time to do questions today so please feel free to ask away the first question we have is from julie it's just a point of clarification from for arnie um, so julie says just to clarify the customs valuation is the price that you would be selling the product at not for price you are buying the product at, like the wholesale cost. Is that right, Arnie? Yeah. So the the <laughs> the price is the price that you need is the price that you would be selling it to. Yes. So it's it's the sale price, but of course it needs to be 
following the evaluation rules. So there would be additions and deletions to be made. Um, and you would need to look at and just see if the price is established as it would be on the on the open market. And that's a really simplified way of, of explaining it. But 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 that is it. So you you find the price that the buyer is willing to pay. The the buyer is not related to you. The buyer has no you know reasons to manipulate the price, or you would not manipulate the price. And uh, that would be the preferred method of establishing value. Cool. Thank you, Arnie. And, and Julie's already said thank you for that uh, clarification. Um, this is one actually touching on a point you finished on, David. Um, this is from Sharon. And sh she asks about um, kind of a bit about the work which might be being done to prepare for any kind of potential impact of a border. Um, is that something you can share a little bit about or kind of what sort of things are being talked about, if, if you can, can say? Wow. How much time do you have? Um, so the the specific uh, bit that i was alluding to is that customs and excise are changing the um the computer system that handles the export and import customs entries um the current computer system uh, in its present state can handle the present business and the future computer system um can also handle the present business now if you uh, move to uh, a hard Brexit, there is something like a sevenfold increase in the number of customs entries that will have to be handled by the customs computer system. And w without expanding the new system, if you add it to the old system, it just about copes. But there are peaks and troughs in things. And what customs have investigated and are preparing to do is to provide a pre peaks and troughs hold back of non-argent customs entries so that even in the worst case scenario there will be very minimal delays on uh, border uh, uh, transits that's the main point that i was trying to make uh, earlier on i hope that's clear hey, thank you that's really interesting um i'm sure more will come out about, about all of that in, 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 in the coming months and, and years, potentially. Um, a question, this will be for Arnie, this is from Louisa. Um, he, she says, uh, you mentioned the export to Saudi Arabia of an, of an item from UK of Canada origin, and then you'd have to comply both with UK and Canadian export regulations. She kind of asked for a bit more explanation about that, and in what way would you have to comply with both? I think that was for David. David, do you want to that go was, first? That was me. Yeah, um, so this came out of a, a, a Tilsig meeting at Rolls-Royce where um, there is a, a, a chap who's recently qualified with a, an exemplary record in your MBA um, uh, qualification through the IOE. And um, his uh, situation was that he has to comply with the export control regulations of the countries of the origin of the parts of anything that he's selling. So if he's got um, a, uh, a fan blade for a jet engine that comes out of Canada, that has the possibility of being used in both civil and military aircraft, for example, and there is an embargo by the Canadians for the use of Canadian products in military um, equipment at, in, a, in a given destination country, then that embargo still applies, although the goods have been brought into the UK to be incorporated in an overall engine. That's a specific example, and I hope it uh, clarifies the question. I can add a little bit to it. Um, um, it just to say you're, you're spot on, it's a different set of rules. It doesn't cover the topic of today, but in export controls, it is the end user that is important. So if you transition it around the world, then the Canadian export control would still be interested to see where the final product ends up and if it ends up in a country which the originating country has embargo to blah about then there are export licensing requirements um, in Canada the UK itself may impose those and that's why you end up with a myriad of different licensing requirements from around the world 
But this just goes to show you that it can get really complex. So if you think that what I've tried to sum up in 20 minutes, um, or what David tried to say on how the goods move, is already complex, wait until you enter the world of export controls, which is going to add another layer of complexity to the whole thing. And the reason why it is important that we know and we are aware of these is because David will do, his company will do the heavy lifting for you. He will do what he can and what is in his power to make sure the goods arrive where they're supposed to go, where you want them to go, and he will clear the goods that arrive for you as good as he can. But in the end, it is you that need to tell him what you want, and you need to shoulder the burden of responsibility. Um, and that means you need to know about all of the things that David puts into his computer system. And if you don't know the basics of how custom need to be or, or managed and export control needs to be managed, then you're going to run into trouble um, earlier or, or, or later. Arne, I think we're jointly painting a fairly gloomy picture here. It's really not difficult if you follow the rules, but it's just important that you have to follow the rules. Okay, but um, yeah, next, I mean, we're, we're still on, I've got again, a fair few questions on controls, interestingly. So um, we'll do one more on, on the area of controls. And that's uh, a question from Claire, just kind of said, there's no mention of the EMCS, um, the exercise movement and control system, and how that might be affected post-Brexit. And also someone's mentioned ITAR, the International Traffic and Arms Regulations. Um, just quickly, I mean, what, what sort of impact or where could these both be post-Brexit? Uh, I don't know if Arnie or David wants to start on that. I can make a start yep. if you want. So um, the MCS is the Excise Movement Control System. Uh, again, that's outside the this 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 customs bit. Um, but there again, it is, it is on, on Brexit terms, pretty clear. The UK will no longer be part of the EMCS movement, and therefore any excisable goods will be treated as third country goods coming in. Um, and for this, then excise duty needs to be paid as you bring excisable goods from the UK to the EU at the current at the current negotiation, if nothing else is agreed. If the transitional deal agrees to continue with EU legislation, then EMCS will also apply. And uh, ITAR, I don't know, David, do you want to do ITAR? Yeah, um, ITAR is, is is largely US controlled, um, but uh, so so I can't see any major changes as a result of Brexit. It will simply be um, the the fact that goods will have to go through border controls if we have a hard Brexit. Um, but other than that, the controls will still remain in place. Thank you both. And yeah, I think I'm going to park controls questions for now because it is something we will probably return to in a in a future webinar. Um, a question, a really interesting question from Tim, um, and this will be for you, David. Uh, he's asked, what happens if a shipper provides the incorrect commodity code? Because there seems to be a lot of responsibility on the shipper in this case. Kind of what, what happens when thing goes, things go wrong, as it were? Well, um, it is the shipper's uh, absolute responsibility to provide the uh, commodity code, and the uh, logistics solutions provider will not get involved in uh, pointing this out. Customs and excise uh, will run audits, um, whether that be for export or for import, and if you're found to be non-compliant, there are penalties. If you have under-declared an import um, for duty, then uh, customs want what is due to them, and um, if you over-declare, then you're entitled to get it back. But in either case, it uh, will come out at your customs uh, and or VAT audit, and uh, there will be um, issues from that. Now, Bollery in particular, and I know one or two other companies, do offer a customs audit service, um, which helps to uh, ensure that uh, clients are compliant. Um, but at the end of the day, we can only provide advice. We can't be, um, you know, we, we can't be prescriptive on it. Um, but we do offer an, uh, an advisory service to help companies to maintain compliance with uh, with customs regulations. Thank you, thank you, David. And a really interesting question just sent in advance, actually, which I really wanted to put to put to Arnie. Um, how might services be affected kind of post-Brexit if, if WTO 
tariffs come in for goods? Kind of what what's the what's the situation for thing, things like services post post Brexit potentially? Okay, so I probably have to disappoint you here. Um, the services discussion is a different discussion from the goods discussion, simply because for services there are new duty pay payments. Um, there may be a lot of licensing requirements and a lot of um, other uh, requirements that, that might need to be fulfilled. And I'm thinking in particular on passporting rights for, for banking services or so on. Um, but I wouldn't, that wouldn't necessarily touch the customs uh, authorities or the, um, the movement of, of goods. So unless we are talking again in the field of export controls and we're talking about the services that are provided in assistance for export controlled goods, I wouldn't actually be able to comment much on services at this point. Yeah, it's a it's a good point. And um, again, we we have covered services in previous webinars, so hopefully that's something which people can get answers to there. And another question: this one is about AEOs. Again, something you touched upon, Arnie. Could you just explain a little bit about how kind of what AEO is? Just to introduce the topic and how it might be useful for companies before or after Brexit. Sure. So here's my take on AEO. So David may have a different take anyway. <laughs> um, so AEO is the Authorized Economic Operator Program or scheme. It's a trusted trader scheme. It's a voluntary scheme that you can apply for. And then if you show compliance in the field of, of customs um, and or security, so it comes in different forms, then uh, you may be entitled for um, to, to some trade facilitations. Um, AEO is ideal if you are importing and exporting already and you will need to show that you are trading for a for a period of time uh, in order to be eligible you will also be audited on this so you need to show that the, you have robust customs procedures and processes in place to get this kite mark this this the rubber stamp of approval from customs um, so if you're newly starting out it is probable that you're not going to be able to obtain this AEO status overnight it'll have to be you'll have to be trading for a while and then um, the benefits also are something that are, that is a continuous debate whether they're actually helpful or not if you're operating relief schemes that I've mentioned uh, AEO will in my opinion be a in essence mandatory way to go because this is the only way you will avoid the financial guarantee um, issues that, that arise when operating things like customs warehouse where potential duty may um, you know maybe maybe charged if you get it wrong and so for this a guarantee is required now but this is already quite an advanced um, customs uh, procedure that you're then operating so you are operating in a different um, sphere so AEO is for those people that will go international they will set up a robust custom system uh, in their company um, and they are experts in what they do. So um, David's company, for example, is AEO certified since because they're experts in what they do. Correct, David? Yeah, uh, in fact, we are the first uh, AEO in the United Kingdom um, as, as, as Bollery and uh, we also help companies to attain AEO status as uh, part of our offering. Um, but the important thing about that is that we only do it if there is a business benefit to that exporter or importer in achieving AEO status. Arne has touched on the um, inward and outward processing reliefs, the customs warehousing regimes. Um, all of those have a financial benefit to um, importers and exporters uh, if AEO is in place. But AEO costs in five figures to achieve, realistically, uh, more if you go to some of the um, larger consultancy practices. Um, but if, you, um, if, if it doesn't work for you, then there's no point in having it. There, there, are, uh, there, there is talk of there being a sort of first and second class uh, citizenship, if you like, in terms of the export side of things for security um, as a result of AEO. It's not happening yet. We think it will in due course, but it's uh, it's not a tangible benefit as yet. The main one is, as Anna says, if you're doing these these customs warehousing regimes. 
Thank you, and uh, yeah, interesting to hear you're the first first one. Um, we're going to do, yeah, and, and also as mentioned, uh, there's a webinar in a couple of weeks' time, which we're running on AEO, um, which may not be relevant to everyone, but if you are interested, then do have a look on the site for info about that. And we're going to do one more question. I think this is going to be probably for Arnie. Um, it's from Jake, and he asks, what how can we, as the exporter, guarantee we get the correct commodity code when they occasionally can be up for interpretation? Is there a governing body that is able to make a ruling slash offer advice that will be absolutely accurate? Arnie? Yes, the answer is yes. Yes, you can have it absolutely accurate. You will let HMRC do it for you. Um, so, huh, I can see David's head shaking. Now let me clarify. I'm this. nodding. There is I'm something. Nodding, Arnie. Oh, you're nodding. Oh, good. I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad. Yeah, BTAs. Yeah, we're doing them all the time. Yes. So um, BTI is binding tariff information. Um, mm -hmm. And again, I'll refer to David in a moment. Um, I'm sure that he's his company is perfectly placed to help you with the uh, with the application form. But basically, if you're unsure and you just can't figure it out by yourself, then you apply for the government to help you. Um, and they have a free service whereby they will classify it for you. Now, it comes with advantages and disadvantages of doing so. Again, we need to spend more time on another webinar to sort this out. But the short answer is yes, there is. You can do it yourself. Uh, it's free. If you want to discuss it before submitting it, uh, your application to HMRC or to the customs authorities, then 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 um, your, your third party logistic providers or Consultancy are always a good place to go to just brainstorm whether what you are planning to write in your application is really um, what you what is in your interest of, of writing. I don't know how more diplomatically I can say it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And the, the um, uh, again, we, we you're right. We do offer um, a service of, of a customs audit, and if there are opportunities for BTIs, um, we would normally work on a gain share basis with the uh, with the um, importer um, to uh, get benefit for both organisations. Great. Well, um, thank you. On that note, thank you both, um, Arnie and David for today's um, session. I think it's a really great overview of customs and all the things which will touch, touch upon it as well. So thank you both for your help today. Of course, it's a pleasure. Um, just one thing to say, and I know you're going to say this. Well, you are, you are just saying it right now, so I will not say, say it. You say it, Will. Because <laughs> I could see it on the screen. No worries. Yeah, I mean, as Arnie is alluding to, um, if you'd like further support or want to learn more about the topic, or would like to even train yourself to become an expert in the topic, um, the Institute has so much to offer you, whether that's qualifications like the Diploma in World Customs and Regulations, training courses which go into some of the processes of exporting or importing mentioned today, or for our technical helpline, you can head over to export.org.uk and find out more about all of these activities and how you can get involved with us and sign up for membership as well. Uh, and now, yeah, um, just to conclude, the the Regional Trade Summit program is is uh, returning in Newcastle, and that's coming up fast on March 13th. We have another great summit as well coming up in Scotland on April 25th, as well as our graduation ceremony in May, where you can network with the future stars of international trade. More information about all of these activities is on export.org.uk forward slash events. Our next webinar is on AEO, as mentioned, or Authorised Economic Operator Status, and what you need to know about it. That's on March 14th with Vartan Consultancy, and you can sign up to that and watch all of our previous webinars at opentexport.com forward slash webinars. And as always, please do take our exit survey to let us know what you thought of today's webinar and to give us any suggestions for future topics or improvements. But for now, thank you everyone for coming and uh, I hope everyone has a warmish rest of the day, um, if possible. But yeah, thank you everyone.